Uh, well, CARE started 76 years ago, actually, mm. in post-World War II Europe, delivering care packages to those who were hungry and in need. I don't think we could have imagined that 75 years later we would be responding to the kind of threshold and scale of humanitarian crisis that we see here today. Over 4 million people have crossed the border in the last six-plus weeks. 7 million people are internally displaced in Ukraine. I'm actually here standing at the border of, of Ukraine and Poland, and just we're greeting a, a group of Ukrainian refugees. Refugees. Several thousand a day are coming through this station alone, and they're coming with uh, with just suitcases on their back, maybe their cats or their dogs. We're providing them through Polish uh, Humanitarian Action and other organizations that we're partnered with, just basics. Uh, we, right behind me, you can see diapers. We have food. We have drink. We have just, as, as the volunteers told me today, love and peace that we're greeting them with. And then we're helping them and supporting them along their journey, which, uh, which is how do they get accommodation? How do they get some cash to get through uh, the next days ahead? How do they have a SIM card? And there are humanitarian actors and amazing uh, support from uh, volunteers here in Poland that are um, they're providing some degree of solace to those who have lost everything. I know the, the people there and in many other countries as well, just incredible in this speed of the response and the support they're providing. Michelle, has the conversation evolved from what can we do in the immediacy of this crisis to, OK, we were hoping this was going to be a, perhaps several weeks, a number of months. And now there's a recognition that these people might be displaced, might have to build new lives and be there for perhaps years rather than months. That's right. That's right. I mean, I think we have no certainty about any end in sight. And so people, as they're crossing the border at first, are simply saying, I just have to find safety, right? I mean, literally, the, the, the house that I was living in was bombed. I had no choice but to leave. But now they're also trying to think about, how am I going to support my family? What kind of job am I going to be able to find? And keep in mind that you're crossing over to other countries where you likely uh, may not speak the language. And, uh, and so they're also thinking about how do they educate their children? How do they get their their kids back in school from an interrupted education? Um, and that's also where CARE and other organizations are starting to um, support so that people can start to think about how do they get through the coming months and how do they rebuild their lives to go forward? This is why what you're doing in Poland is so important. We had the founder of Chobani on this week and he said, you know, you, you don't stop being a refugee just because you get somewhere safe. You stop being a refugee when you start building a life, when you when you have a job, when your children are being educated. And what you're trying to do in, in Poland is recruit Ukrainian teachers that have been displaced that can perhaps help children who've been traumatized integrate into Polish schools. So it helps the Polish teachers, it helps the Polish children who are now surrounded by other children, but also it helps the grown-ups, the teachers that have lost their jobs in, in Ukraine, also get work and start building their lives too. Yeah, I mean, you've just described what is a fairly simple solution to an enormous problem. So first of all, I have to think about over 700,000 children that have crossed over to Poland alone. Uh, I was just in Warsaw yesterday and saw and met with administrators. Imagine you're an administrator who's just gotten through COVID and takes a sigh and then uh, have 15,000, and there are 70,000 kids in Warsaw, only 15,000 of them are back in the school system, but they don't speak uh, Polish. And so we're hiring those refugees that were teachers already, that need a job, that are ready to have some stability, and they're going to be the bridge. They're going to be the support. They're going to help ensure that these kids uh, can get back to a little bit of normalcy by speaking their own language and integrating into the Polish school system. So yeah. that's the kind of work that lies ahead for us. What do these what do these people tell you? Because it's obviously predominantly women who are leaving. What do these women say to you when you say, hi, we're going to recruit you, we're going to give you a job, we're going to pay you a salary to do the thing that you probably love? So much gratitude. If you could see those teachers and they, as they start the start the process and you know, sign up at the desk and by the end of the process in which they're leaving with their certificate to go and support and teach for the next three months, just a different kind of attitude. One of the teachers I talked to, she's a fifth grade civics and history teacher. She talked about the fact that she's still doing Zoom calls with her class 
Um, they are all around, spread all around Europe. Some of them are still in Ukraine. And she's just trying to provide them some psychosocial support. And uh, she was so grateful for the opportunity to now teach, to be able to support her own family, her 13-year-old daughter who moved very reluctantly, who left everything that she knew and is now here in a different country. And, uh, and she talked about the fact that she is, it, this is really going to make a difference for the Ukrainian children, which she feels like are, are her broader classroom. And uh, she, she also described what she hoped for, which was such a normal wish. She said, I'm hoping for peace and I'm hoping for the opportunity to have a barbecue with sausages with my <sighs> children, the 35 Aww. children from her classroom. I know. I mean, yeah, it's a beautiful story. And the fact that she's still doing the Zoom calls with with children back in Ukraine as well. It's some degree of stability for all these children that's being provided. Um, I know women and the protection of women from the initial stages, the trauma, the, as you said, the, the diapers, or in my world, the, the nappies behind you. But it, it goes on from that too, to try and tackle things like exploitation, abuse. And when you've got so many people displaced, going off into different areas, Michelle, how do you protect against some of those kind of risks? And, and what's your primary concern today? Yeah, well, as I said, 90% of those who are leaving are women and, and children. And so they are particularly vulnerable in any crisis, in any humanitarian situation. It, it just think about the fact that there are, by our CARES estimates, about 80,000 women right now that are going to give birth that are in Ukraine or leaving Ukraine in the next three months. So think wow. about the extra vulnerability of what that means. Think about gender-based violence, which increases during times of conflict. Think about the fact that people are fleeing with nothing but suitcases. Many wonderful, good people are helping and supporting them and bringing them into their homes. But that can sometimes mean that there is in, there are incidents of exploitation. So we. Care and other organizations are really hoping to ensure that we have that we register people appropriately, that we provide them the right kind of information so that they can be safe, so that we don't take a crisis that has already made them vulnerable and have that vulnerability be exploited. And uh, it's just really important that we are very focused on the specific needs of women and children in this crisis. Michelle, if people want to provide support, if they want to donate, where do they go? How do they help? Yeah, I mean, there are ways of both lifting up your voices and also providing resources. So if you go to care.org, you can learn about what CARE is doing. You can learn about the crisis itself and you can um, you can stand up and stand in solidarity. It means so much. As I talked to one of the teachers yesterday who broke down crying and she told me, I never knew that people that I never knew would do so much uh, for me. And um, And you can all be a part of that care.org. We'll tweet that out too. Michelle, thank you to you and your team for your work. Great to have you on. Thanks. Michelle Nunn, President thank you and so CEO much. of Care USA. Thank you.